My name is Charles Klein, and until October 16th, April 20th, 2010, was the worst day of my life. April 20th was the day I came home early from a business trip and found my wife of six years, the mother of our five-year-old daughter, in bed with that asshole Trent Miller. I'll talk about what happened on October 16th a little later. I can't say that the discovery of her infidelity came as a complete surprise. There were signs that Haley was unhappy with both me and our lifestyle. The recent recession had crippled our personal finances. We had bought a house just before the crash, so we were in a tight spot with the mortgage. Our debt exceeded the current value of the house. Haley wanted to quit the whole thing. I, on the other hand, figured we could get through it and everything would be fine in the end. But the most frustrating part was that Haley insisted that we just had to have this house and we procrastinated to buy a four-bedroom mega mansion. Now she complains that most of our income goes to mortgage payments. Ever since Christmas, which disappointed Haley when her gift was less than expected, Haley has been a pain in the ass. Nothing I said or did gave her pleasure. The only pleasure in my life came from Tina, our daughter. Tina's eyes would light up when I opened the front door after a day of work, and it was a welcome response compared to the look of contempt on Haley's face. I won't list all the reasons I married Haley Turner. It was a mistake from the start. She's a very beautiful woman, at least in appearance. We were both in failed relationships. We were both good-looking. We both looked around, saw that all of our friends were married, wondered why we weren't married, and ended up at the altar. All of these reasons are not good reasons to get married. The marriage may have started for the wrong reasons, but I fell in love with Haley, and that love blossomed after Tina was born. Many couples break up after having children. Ours only seemed to strengthen. Turns out Haley was either a great actress or a schizoid, or maybe both. Up until the end of last year, I thought we had a strong relationship and a great family. Silly me. I told Haley I'd be back from my business trip on Thursday, but I got home on Wednesday. Haley worked in the mornings and Tina was in school, so Haley was free in the afternoons, so I decided to take a chance. I drove down our street and saw an unfamiliar car up ahead. It wasn't exactly discreet on Haley's part, but we weren't friends with any of the neighbors. More than half the street had been empty since the housing crisis. I walked into the house. I didn't need to be particularly quiet because of the noise coming from the master bedroom. I stood and watched for a few seconds, long enough to take a few pictures on my phone. I didn't tense up, I didn't get angry. I just felt an overwhelming sadness at the realization that my marriage was over. There was no way we could get past the infidelity and total betrayal of trust. Now came the question of how screwed up my life would be when we divorced. As bad as our financial situation was, it would only get worse. I would become a part-time father to my daughter, never again to hug or make love to the woman I had fallen in love with. Haley turned to look at me and did the unexpected. She screamed at me. Get out of here, Charlie. What the hell are you doing home today? I was stunned and reacted in the worst way possible. I pulled Haley's hair until her face was directly in front of mine and yelled back. You're an idiot. You have the nerve to ask me why I came home a day early? You're having fun with that asshole in my bed and you have the nerve to attack me? I didn't notice Trent behind me. While all this was going on, he grabbed his phone and dialed 911. We were still yelling at each other when the cops arrived. Trent met them at the front door. He was still wrapped in a sheet when they burst into the bedroom. Based on the fact that I pulled Haley's hair and nothing more, I was handcuffed and taken to jail. It took me a few days to get the money together to post bail. In that time, there was nothing left in our accounts and Haley had disappeared with Tina. I came home to an empty house. When I returned to work on Monday, there was a bailiff waiting for me in the lobby. Haley had filed for divorce on the grounds of mental and physical abuse. I filed a countersuit using adultery as the cause. Not that it did any good. The courts did their job of giving custody to Haley. I had to pay child support and alimony. My credit rating dropped like a rock after we got rid of the house. I still had a job, but my life was shit. If it wasn't for Tina, I would have just left town. There was one bright spot. I was cleared of all spousal assault charges. Now, too many evenings I spent sitting on a bar stool at Johnny's Tavern, listening to a bunch of drunks tell me that they wouldn't let that happen to them. More than one of them argued that I wasn't much of a man for letting some guy steal my wife. I changed bars after I heard several drunks say, Cuckoo, 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 as I was leaving one night. I couldn't shake the feeling of disrespect. My co-workers, both male and female, looked at me with either pity or contempt. 
I began to contemplate some of the advice given by the drunks, my former friends at Johnny's. They were very generous with innuendo and bravado. How they would get revenge. How I should get back at the couple who had put horns on my head and made my life a living hell. One Sunday when I had Tina, we went to visit my parents. After dinner, Tina retired to her room to watch TV while my mother and father sat with me at the table drinking coffee. I shocked my parents by telling them about my powerlessness and that I needed to do something to regain my manhood. My father broke the silence. Do you want revenge, Charlie? I don't know, Dad. I just feel like I have to do something. Revenge is a complicated thing, son. It seems to fill a void, but it rarely does. It can also get out of control. You get back at them, and their friends or family retaliate. Just ask any Chicago gangbanger how well the eye for an eye principle works. While I generally respected my father's approach to problem solving, he thought first before he spoke or acted, I just didn't want to play the role of cuckold. Charlie, I'll be very disappointed if you commit any act of revenge against them. I raised you better than that. Just forget it. Violence rarely solves problems. Despite my father's admonition, one Saturday night, everything fell into place. I was coming out of my diner when I saw Trent and Haley across the street, coming out of one of the more expensive restaurants in this part of town. While they waited for the valet to bring their car around, they engaged in a kiss. A car pulled up, a beautiful Lexus, and the couple jumped into it. As soon as the car pulled away from the curb, I saw Haley's head drop into Trent's lap. I walked over to my seven-year-old Chevy and sat down for a moment. I cussed loudly, pounding my fists on the steering wheel. Once I calmed down, I turned the ignition key. The car I drove the only one I could afford now that my finances were in total disrepair, barely squeaked before starting. I thought I'd thought it through. I was pretty damn smart. I took my time and thought I had my plans all figured out. A few weeks later, I approached Trent at night, and before he knew it, I was already hitting him in the ribs with a bat. I avoided his head. I didn't want to kill him, just badly cripple the man who had made me a cuckold. I swung the bat a second time and broke his right leg. The third swing severed his right arm. Now he was lying on the ground trying to cover himself, and I was trying to hit him in the groin. At that moment, someone shouted from a neighboring house. Stop! I've already called the police! I rushed out running, throwing the bat, jacket, and mask into a dumpster three blocks from the house. The next time I picked Tina up for a date, Haley came right out and asked if I had attacked Trent. My plan was to give Haley a long sweat. She could just wait until I decided it was time for her turn. In response to her question, I only smirked, not admitting anything, but not denying it either, just letting her sweat. Of course, I was the prime suspect, and the police had questioned me more than once. I had no alibi, I simply said I spent the evening alone in my apartment. There were no witnesses to claim otherwise and the weapon was never found. There was nothing but motive to link me to the crime until... One of the drunks hanging out at Johnny's got in trouble with the law. Trying to cut a deal, he asked if the cops would find the guy who beat the guy up with a baseball bat. The cops and the prosecutor made a deal, and the drunk said he knew it was me. He claimed I bragged about how I would have killed the guy with the bat. The drunk was lying, of course, but that didn't seem to bother the cops or the DA. I was charged with aggravated assault and attempted murder. Because of my current financial means, I was assigned a public defender. The DA built most of the case against me on circumstantial evidence and the false testimony of a drunk. He cleaned himself up for the trial, though. The jury found me not guilty of attempted murder, but guilty of aggravated assault. Thing is, I couldn't swear too hard. I beat the shit out of Trent with that bat. But one circumstance played in my favor. It was three months from the time of the assault to the sentencing. Trent's two broken ribs broken arm and leg were fused. Trent didn't look much like a victim when he showed up for trial or sentencing. I think that's the only reason the judge sentenced me to a lesser term. Nevertheless, I was given five years in a medium security prison. So what happened on October 16th that was worse than the day I caught my wife having fun with Trent? That was the day I made nice to my cellmate, Ronald Iron Ron Young. I am not bisexual, and I have never had a repressed desire to be with a man. I simply had no choice. I have no teeth, a broken nose, and two black eyes to validate my reluctance to enter into this prison relationship. Ron and his gang of Aryans manhandled me until I had no choice. Do it or die. Two positives came out of this disaster. Ron is not sharing, hence I am not available to other Aryans, and I am now protected from non-Aryan gangs. 
Devil's bargain. What kind of sick culture condemns a person to such a sick punishment? I committed a crime and I understand the sentence of the court. At least five years behind bars, loss of freedom and all that goes with it. But why do we wince and even joke about inhumane sexual abuse of prisoners? What happened to an eye for an eye? I didn't rape anyone. Why do I have to be subjected to this sexual abuse to survive? Getting inside information is very difficult. After six long months and dozens of letters, my mother visited me. My dad still wouldn't talk to me, and my mom came not out of sympathy for my situation, but to vent. Haley married Trent and they moved to Texas. They wouldn't let your father and I see Tina before they moved. They wouldn't let her come to the phone when we tried to call Tina. My only grandchild and I can't see or talk to her. I called Haley's mother and pleaded with her, trying to appeal to her sense of justice, one grandmother to another. She had the nerve to laugh at me. I can't understand such cruelty. It runs in their family, Mom. I never cheated on Haley. She's the one who cheated on me. All my letters to Tina came back unopened. I'm working with one of the prison attorneys. Maybe the judge will get Haley to allow me to communicate with my daughter. Soon after, my mother softened. She realized how much I was hurting, and for the rest of her visit, she began to show love for her only child. I didn't share what was the worst part of my incarceration, and thankfully she didn't ask. By the time she left, she promised to visit me again. I won't go into the details of those five years. I didn't re-educate myself, didn't learn any new skills, didn't become a better person than when I went to prison. And with the exception of one disastrous parole hearing, I learned to hide my emotions and what was in my heart, soul, and mind. During my first year as Iron Ron's cellmate, I gained strength at the gym at every opportunity taking out my hatred for Ron, Haley, and Trent on the scale. My 6x1 height was now 210 pounds of muscle. When Ron found a new mate, Kevin Johansson, who arrived 13 months after me, I was let go, and now I had to fend for myself. The first time they came for me, there were two of them. They beat the shit out of me, but those two ended up in the hospital, and I went into special housing for a month. What's worse? My first parole hearing was already scheduled for that month and was not rescheduled. It was another two years before I met with the parole board. I answered their questions for 20 minutes before I was at a loss for words. Silly me, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. After some smug jerk asked why I never apologized for bullying my ex-wife, I just spat out all the venom that had built up in my soul. I was married to Haley for six years and never once raised a hand to her. She had fun with him in our bed. The only thing I did was a stupid attack on her boyfriend. Because of that one stupid act I was forced to make nice to a man to survive, I was involved in a dozen fights to avoid being raped. The justice system allowed her to falsely accuse me of violence, take all of our property, and make it so I couldn't hire a decent lawyer. The justice system allows my bitch ex-wife to deny me contact with my daughter. Needless to say, I served all five years. For five years, I heard nothing from my daughter. My lawsuit to force Haley's treatment went nowhere. Five years I fought for my life. When I say I didn't learn any new skills, that's not really true. No new legal skills. I now knew how to use the internet to swindle people out of money. I took a night job loading trucks at a local warehouse. It paid just over minimum wage, enough to keep me off the streets. I spent my days working on my new computer with money saved from years in prison, developing my alter ego, Amy Carson. Amy Carson was a widow who intended to build a humane shelter for unwanted dogs and cats. The Save Our Furry Friends website invited monetary contributions. Tens of thousands of email addresses collected over the past three years ensured that potential donors would be sent out. The first mailing didn't cost a dime. The result was not bad. Some cash came in, checks and credit card information were sold to an offshore criminal. Two months later, I had $21,000 more than enough to accomplish the first of my two post-prison goals. Candy Sweet sat on a bar stool looking like a vision. It had been over six years since I'd last touched a woman. Wanting to experience all the sensations, I went all out. I had a certificate from the clinic. I was clean, in my fist and $700 in my pocket. I even dressed decently, slacks and a sport coat from the Goodwill store. Candy turned and looked at me as I approached her. Charlie? Her smile lit up the dark bar. She was wearing pants. Why pants and not a skirt? Because I was to spend the night with such a beautiful escort for the obscenely low price of $600, plus tip, hence the $700 in my pocket. 
the slacks hid the fact that Candy has a prosthetic leg. Apparently, more than one customer had seen her metal leg and insisted on a discount. Although the prosthetic leg made no difference to me, I was happy to save an extra couple hundred. I asked the bartender for a shot of bourbon and sat down next to Candy. She already had some kind of drink in front of her, something in a martini glass. I looked past her and saw the guy to her right giving me a dirty look. The last thing I wanted was for this night to start off wrong. The gentleman next to me insisted on buying me this drink. I told him I was waiting for someone and that it wasn't necessary. Candy put her hand on my shoulder, and I took that as a signal not to get upset. I silently counted to five and remained calm. I pulled a $20 bill out of my wallet. Excuse me, sir. I appreciate you buying my companion a drink, but I'm sure a gentleman like you will do me the courtesy of repaying your kindness. Having said that, I rose from my bar stool, holding an Andrew Jackson in my right hand, but holding it so that he could see the scars on the back of that hand, ugly scars from numerous prison fights. I wanted him to understand. My words might suggest meekness, but my posture was not meek at all. The man sized me up and, thank goodness, smirked. He took the 20. Can't blame a guy for trying with such a beautiful lady. Have a nice date. With those words, he got up from his bar stool and walked away to the other end of the bar. Candy looked at me. Thanks for acting like a gentleman. He wasn't too pushy, and it would have been a shame to end our date with you in jail and me still sitting here. Where did you learn to diffuse the situation so well? It's too early to start talking about my life now, and I've been told it's best not to ask escorts personal questions. Let's talk about these cabanas. When the bartender placed my bourbon in front of me, I was surprised. It's on the house. I appreciate you being so polite about it. We had a fight here last week when some drunk wouldn't leave another guy's date alone. Cost me 400 bucks to repair the damage. I'll never see a dime from the drunk who started it all, and my insurance exceeds the amount of the damage. I raised my glass to the owner bartender and took a sip. He even poured me a good one. Candy and I finished our drinks, said goodbye to the bartender, nodded to the other guy, and walked out into the night air. I have a room next door. Do you need anything to eat before we head over there? No, I'm fine. Maybe we'll order pizza or Chinese food later. It's your money. We'll do whatever you want. I didn't need to be asked twice. I took Candy's hand and led her to the hotel. As we rode the elevator, I couldn't shake the silly grin off my face. Candy looked up at me. What? You're just so damn beautiful. We walked into the room and got right down to it. Then we rested for a while. I wasn't expecting that. Candy looked at me. What? I didn't expect it to be so good and for you to like it so much. Candy laughed. Well, I'm a professional. She was still laughing, but not at me anymore. I've never paid for this before. I guess I thought someone who did it for a living would be somewhat pampered. That she'd have to pretend. But you didn't seem to be pretending. Thank you. Do you want to order now? We ordered Chinese food, showered while we waited. It was the first time I came face to face with her prosthetic, which was close enough to touch. When I looked at it, it was metal just below the knee. She interrupted my musings. Does it bother you? Actually, no. It's just that I've never seen one of these before. It's amazing if you think about it. When we walked to the room, I didn't notice. You were walking without limping in the slightest. Then we made love again and went to bed. Waking up the next morning, we showered again and Candy caught me looking at her prosthetic leg. It was a motorcycle accident. What? My leg. Everyone wants to know how it happened. You were too polite to ask. Like I said last night, I was told not to get personal. But now that you bring it up, how did it happen? The guy I was dating was Randy. He bought a new bike and wanted to show it off. Claimed he was a great rider and knew what he was doing. I was stupid and sat in the back. He wanted to impress me, so he started showing me he was going fast. He lost his front end, we went down, and I lost my leg. What happened to Randy? Neither of us were wearing a helmet, another stupid decision. He hit his head on a lamppost, went into a coma, was unconscious for a week until the machine was turned off, and he died. I should have a bigger heart, I know I sound cold, but the bastard crashed and my leg is gone. He didn't even have insurance. All my medical bills and that leg cost a fortune. 
that's my excuse for being a whore. The worst part? When my mom and dad found out what I did for a living, they cut me out of their lives. They didn't want a whore as a daughter. There are worse things than getting paid for sex. Yeah? Like what? Like my ex-wife, for example. So I told Candy about Haley. When I finished, she agreed. My ex was an even bigger slut. When she said that, all I could do was laugh. Probably the first time I'd ever laughed at the whole thing. Are you hungry? Can I buy you breakfast? Yeah, that would be nice. Then I have to get to class. I'm not going to be a slut for the rest of my life. You hear about guys falling in love with prostitutes, and when you get a woman like Candy, I can understand how that happens. But let's be realistic. She's a prostitute, and even if she wasn't, what could I offer a woman, any woman? The next day, I looked forward to the second part of my plans. I met Juwan Price at one of the diners downtown. Juwan was an outside liaison for one of the black prison gangs. Juwan named a price, and I agreed on one condition. When the knife cut his throat, two names, mine and Johansson's, would be whispered in his ear. Having agreed to this, I gave Juwan $15,000. Juwan was one of the smartest. He was accused but never convicted. I heard what was going on inside. I can't blame you for wanting revenge. No, it's not revenge, it's justice. Johansson was a good guy. A little over a year after he became Young's playmate, he died. Rumors swirled around the yard that Ron had held the kid's head too long and strangled him. Johansson deserved better. Young spent two months in solitary confinement and was jailed for not reporting Johansson's death until the next morning. That's about it. Well, whatever the reason, he's a dead man, guaranteed. I don't need to tell you that no one will ever find out about our deal. Right? I understand. I haven't lasted five years talking nonstop. Yuan only nodded and left. Four days later, four inmates were killed in a prison riot caused by the stabbing death of Arian Ronald, Iron Ron Young. One inmate was suspected of the murder. He was one of those killed in the subsequent riot, and the prison was closed for three days. The Amy Carson website had served its time. I shut it down before law enforcement took notice and started harassing me. It was all a small thing now. Too little money had been invested in this case for any agencies to investigate. Now I was interested in finding Tina. Haley's Facebook page had disappeared two years ago. The last post had said their family lived in the Dallas suburbs. Tina had just turned nine, and the happy family, Haley, Trent, and Tina, posed in front of the gates at Disneyland. And then nothing. Imagine my surprise when, just for fun, I typed Trent Miller into Google and found that Trent was living in Chicago again. Nothing came up on Haley, but at least I now had a lead. It cost a private investigator a thousand of my illicitly earned money to find out where Trent lived and worked, that he no longer lived with my ex, and where he liked to hang out after work. It took Trent a few minutes to realize who was sitting on the bar stool next to him. It was understandable since I looked different than the last time he saw me. It was during my sentencing for beating the shit out of him with a Louisville slugger. My muscular build, smashed nose, and shaved head probably looked somewhat imposing. He turned to me and asked, Are we going to have a problem? I had thought about the question beforehand and prepared an answer. No, Trent. Hitting you in the ass with a baseball bat was a mistake last time. It cost me five years of freedom and countless horrors in prison, as well as the pleasure of watching my little girl grow up. I actually came to ask if you know where Tina is. I'd tell you if I did. Haley left me for another guy, and the three of them left for parts unknown. I followed Trent's eyes as he answered. When you're in prison, you learn to make eye contact, because eyes are the windows to the soul. I decided that Trent was telling me the truth. As if to reinforce my intuition, Trent continued. I want you to know something, Charlie. I shouldn't have gotten involved with Haley when she was still married to you. It was wrong. I really loved Haley, and I thought she really loved me. It hurt like hell when she replaced me with that guy. It was the first time I realized how you felt. When we started lunch, she fed me a pack of lies that I didn't realize until I came back here and talked to some of the couples you used to know. When I first met Haley, she told me that you abused her and Tina. Said your marriage was a sham and that it was only a matter of time before she died or got divorced. I thought I was her knight in shining armor. Of course, when you beat the crap out of me, 
It only reinforced her opinion. Trent sipped his beer and continued. I want you to know one more thing. I disagreed with Haley when she cut you and your family out of Tina's life. I thought it was a mistake. Haley told me to back off, that Tina wasn't my child and I had no say in it. Tina and I had a good relationship during those three years. I loved her, but I was never her daddy. Tina missed you. I tried my hardest not to cry when Trent said that, but I'm sure my eyes were watering. Trent turned to the bartender and asked for a pen and a piece of paper. I don't know where they ended up, but here's the name of the joker who replaced me, Barry Stewart. He was a carpenter hired by a Plano real estate developer, Chase Holmes. That son of a bitch was working on a number of specialty homes a block away from our house. I have no idea how he and Haley met. The first I knew about it was the day she packed up his truck and headed out with the bastard. I don't think I would have even known about it if I hadn't gotten a call from one of our neighbors wondering why Haley was dumping shit in the back of the truck. I got home just before they left. We were yelling at each other when the cops pulled up. That was the only reason I recognized his name and place of employment. The cops had no reason to detain them. They left, and I found a note in the kitchen that read, Goodbye. Our accounts had been cleaned out. I spent several thousand trying to find Haley, but got nowhere. A year later, I sued for adultery and abandonment, sold the house, and moved here. Trent's face read resentment as he told his story. The guy still had a grudge against that cunt. And me? I just wanted to see my daughter. I thanked Trent for the information, bought him a beer, and left the bar wondering what to do next. Trent had spent thousands looking for Haley. Why would I spend my limited resources on the same thing? There was one person who most likely knew where Haley and Tina lived, but that person was just as likely to keep me from finding out, Haley's mother. It would be risky if I was caught I would be sent back to prison, but I couldn't think of anything else. Margaret Turner was a woman who didn't change, a complete victim of routine. Margaret went to church every Sunday at 9 a.m. Margaret always left a spare house key in the faux stone next to the patio door. Why bother when Brutus, her pet Rottweiler, was always there to guard the house? At 9.02, I climbed over the fence from the alley behind her house. Key in place, I opened the patio door and heard Brutus growl. A growl that would have scared any normal person. Brutus came around the corner into the kitchen where I stood and hoped. It had been six years since Brutus had last seen and sniffed me, but years didn't matter. Brutus rose up on his hind legs and licked my face. He remembered the man who had picked him up at the shelter brought him to Margaret's house, trained him to sit and lie down, gave him treats every time I visited my mother-in-law. While Brutus was getting to know my face, I walked over to the counter and took a dog treat from the cookie jar Margaret was holding. I threw the treat on the floor and Brutus scrambled away from me to eat it. I took advantage of the pause to look around. Nothing in the kitchen had changed since the day John Turner died nine years ago. There was a computer on Margaret's desk where she paid the bills. I turned on the computer and a password appeared on the screen. I thought for a minute and typed, John 316. The computer began to boot up. While the computer was booting up, I went through my drawers and found some letters with return addresses on the envelopes. Haley lived in El Paso. I inserted a flash drive into the USB port and copied Margaret's photo folder, video folder, and email folder. After getting everything I came for, I shut down the computer, scratched Brutus behind the ears, closed the door, and replaced the key. I spent the rest of Sunday watching videos and pictures of my daughter growing up. Tina has grown so much over the years. She is such a beautiful young girl. I was such a fool to miss those years. Through information gleaned from envelopes and emails, I found out that Haley and Tina now have the last name Turner. Haley lives with Barry Stewart, but is not married to him. Tina was in fifth grade. On Monday, I gave the information and a $500 deposit to a private investigator in El Paso, who confirmed that the address and other information was still current. Tuesday morning after work, I knocked on my parents' door. Although my mother had visited me several times in prison, I hadn't seen my father since the day of my sentencing. That day he had just looked at me with sadness and pain. Now he was standing at the door and I wondered if he would let me in. Hi, Dad. Dad opened the door all the way and pulled me into the house. He looked me straight in the eyes and then hugged me. Mary, Charlie's home. Mom came into the room and hugged me. Would you like some coffee? Yes, please. We sat down at the same kitchen table where I'd eaten lunch as a child. 
Margaret Turner wasn't the only person who liked routine. Mom, Dad, first let me apologize for letting you down. I'm sorry I didn't heed your wise words. I'm sorry that I let a bunch of losers convince me to get revenge. Mom came over and hugged me again. Dad put his hand on my shoulder and squeezed. I know where Haley and Tina are, and I want you to help me re-establish contact with Tina. I have a few thousand to go to El Paso and do whatever is necessary to at least get visitation rights. Will you come with me and help? Dad answered first. What are you planning to do? Nothing violent again, right? I was hurt that because of my past actions, that was the first thing he asked. No. I'm going to consult a lawyer first. I've done my time. I'm not a parolee, so I can go in there and try to get a court order for visitation. But let's be honest, I'm an ex-convict convicted of assault. I think it would be best if my parents came with me and the three of us filed an appeal. Dad looked at Mom, and I could see the pleading in her eyes. She didn't need to say a word, Dad agreed. When do we go? Can you be ready in a week? I need to give notice at work and get some things settled. Can we take your car? We'll need wheels while we're there. Yeah, I'll take it to the shop tomorrow and make sure it's ready to go. We'll head out next Monday, okay? With those words, I drank another cup of coffee and engaged in some family gossip. It felt good to be here again. Over the next few days, I used my free time to find the best family lawyers in the El Paso area. After finding one with great reviews, I called and made an appointment for the following Thursday. That gave us three full days to drive to El Paso. I hoped Dad and Mom would make the trip. Dad was almost 70 and Mom was 66. Dad's Lincoln Continental, turns out good old Mom is a big Matthew McConaughey fan, would have been the perfect car for the trip. But when Dad found out about the Thursday appointment, we all agreed to leave on Sunday and have an extra day to cover the 1,500 miles. That Sunday, I, a 36-year-old man, set out on the trip with my mother and father. We drove out of town. It's all freeways now, but years ago it was Route 66. Before we entered St. Louis, Dad told us how, when he was only three years old, his parents drove that road to Los Angeles. Back then, all the roads were two-lane roads. You couldn't drive more than 400 miles in a day. It took the family seven days to get to Los Angeles. It seems my grandfather, who died before I was born, had a job waiting for him in California. One of his army buddies was in the painting business, and after the war, all the new buildings started being built, which was supposed to be a gold mine. Unfortunately, Dad said his mom, my grandmother, was homesick the whole year they lived in Pasadena. My grandfather packed up the family and returned to Racine. Everything ended up working out for the best. My grandfather became the CEO of an aluminum smelter. He was doing well until he was found hunched over his desk, dead of a heart attack at the age of 58. I was born a year later and was named in his honor. In the four days we spent in the car, Mom and Dad told more stories about the old days. Stories I had either forgotten or was too busy to listen to growing up. I moved away when I was 18, which was the longest we had spent together since our last vacation when I was 14 and we drove to Washington, D.C. Thursday afternoon, we were at the law office of Gladys Harper. Unlike all my previous dealings with the law, this was a positive experience. I told the lawyer the whole truth about how I was convicted, how I was in jail, how I was deprived of communication with Tina, how my parents were deprived of communication as well, my divorce from Haley, her subsequent marriage, and my divorce from Trent. The lawyer's eyes lit up when she heard that Trent was suing for adultery and child abandonment. It didn't give me a pretty picture, but it didn't make Haley an angel either. All of the lawyer's reluctance to take our case faded away when my mother practically broke down in sobs, telling me how she couldn't hold on to her granddaughter. I gave the lawyer a deposit and she started working on the paperwork. Now all we had to do was wait. We decided not to spend the weekend in El Paso, so we traveled again to Big Bend National Park. Although our thoughts were occupied with the events in El Paso, it was an incredible weekend of enjoying the sights of this quiet and stunning park on the Rio Grande River. Four days later, I received a call from Miss Harper, the administrator. We were to meet at her office Tuesday morning to prepare for a hearing before a judge Tuesday afternoon. Gladys Harper was busy. She even had a signed statement from Trent Miller saying that Haley had dumped him and completely severed the relationship between him and Tina. I later learned that Trent did this on one condition. Tina had to be told that Trent had not dumped her and that he loved her. We met again in the lobby of the courthouse and headed to the judge's office. I am not naive. 
It was clear within the first 10 minutes that the judge and our attorney had developed a great working relationship. We answered the judge's questions. Then Ms. Harper made it clear that at this point, we were only seeking a preliminary meeting with Tina to re-establish contact and were willing to have a court-appointed social worker accompany us to the meeting. Ms. Harper told the judge, Given Ms. Turner's past actions in denying the client's contact with Tina and then doing the same with Trent Miller, we ask that Haley Turner not be made aware of the meeting as she will likely use this time to delay the meeting and further turn Tina against the clients. That's where that working relationship and all the money we were paying Harper paid off. You could have knocked me over with a feather when the judge granted the request and set the meeting for the next day. We were to pick Tina up from her school with the judge's order in hand, and we were to be accompanied by Miss Harper and a social worker. We were given three hours to take Tina to a local cafe and talk to her, and then drive Tina home. Walking out of the courthouse into the warm Texas sunshine, I couldn't remember ever feeling as light and happy as I did at that moment. It took all my willpower not to hug Miss Harper right there. She said she was already working on the follow-up paperwork to establish visitation rights for me and my parents. We'll meet tomorrow at 1 o'clock 45 in my office. The social worker will go with you to the school. Once we pick up Tina, I will leave you. The social worker will stay with you until you take Tina home. Until tomorrow, don't do anything that could mess things up. Stay sober, stay calm. Whatever you say or do, especially when Tina's mom overreacts, stay calm. We expect her to do or say something in front of the social worker that will only help us when we petition for visitation. Treat the social worker like she is your friend because she may become one when the case goes back to court. The judge just gave us a valuable gift, so treat it that way. With those words, she walked away. I hugged mom and dad and thanked them again for their help. The next 22 hours dragged on. We stayed close to the hotel and grabbed a bite to eat at the diner across the street. Some part of me expected something bad to happen. Would we show up at Tina's school tomorrow and find that she wasn't there? My parents tried their best to reassure me, but I could see the worry on their faces. We arrived at Gladys Harper's office at 1.30. Five minutes later, a short, stout woman of Hispanic descent entered the office. Miss Marie Hernandez introduced herself and spent several minutes telling us how she would conduct surveillance while trying not to be intrusive. Apparently, she had read our attorney's motions because she was very kind to my mother, like one grandmother to another. Mrs. Hernandez was also kind enough to give us some advice on how best to approach Tina after such a long and traumatic separation. Later, we were glad for this advice. I had been plagued by anxiety about how Tina would react to my appearance. We walked into the school's administrative office 30 minutes before dismissal. The principal and vice principal read the court order, called the district office, and spoke with the legal department before agreeing to allow Tina to leave with us. Ten minutes before the cancellation bell rang, Tina was taken out of class and brought to the vice principal's office. The first person she saw was my mother, and Tina's eyes lit up when she recognized her grandmother. Nana. Tina threw herself into her grandmother's arms, and my mom dropped to one knee to accept and return the hug. She was openly crying. Tina looked up when she saw my father walking toward them. Daddy! exclaimed Tina. When Tina learned to talk, she couldn't pronounce the whole grandpa and started calling him Daddy. That name stuck. We all thought it was cute. Daddy took Tina in his arms, hugged her, and kissed her on the nose. Tina looked at me, who was standing off to the side. Daddy? My appearance was so different from the last time we'd seen each other that the hesitation in her question was understandable. It was one of Mrs. Hernandez's hints. Let Tina see her grandparents first, because they look the same as they did five years ago, and there's always a special bond with grandparents. I knelt down and held out my arms, saying a special prayer that my hug would be accepted and approved. Tina threw herself into my arms. Our reunion was interrupted when the vice principal walked into the office with Haley, who was in the school parking lot waiting to pick up Tina. Haley looked around the room and exploded. What the hell is going on? What are you all doing here? Leave Tina alone. Miss Harper entered the room and Mrs. Hernandez walked in beside her. Miss Harper handed Haley a copy of the court order. Miss Turner, this is a court order that allows Tina's father and grandparents to visit her today for three hours. They will be accompanied by Mrs. Hernandez to ensure Tina's safety and their compliance with the order to return Tina to you within three hours, starting immediately. Haley looked at the papers but didn't read them. 
She tossed the papers back to Miss Harper. I don't care what these papers say. You can't just come in here and take my daughter. Haley pointed at me and my parents. Those people have no business being here. She's my daughter. Haley grabbed onto Tina and Tina hid behind my mom. Mrs. Hernandez, who stood in front of Haley, didn't miss that dynamic. Miss. Turner! Before she could get a word in edgewise, Haley shouted at her, using disparaging language about Mrs. Hernandez's ethnicity, her physique, and where she could shove certain things. Miss. Turner, do you want me to call the police? If so, keep it up, and I guarantee you will be put in jail until you calm down and stop threatening people. At this point, the deputy head teacher intervened and did her best to calm Haley down. They entered her office and we took this opportunity to escape with Tina and Mrs. Hernandez. The four of us sat in a small cafe a few blocks from the school. Mrs. Hernandez sat at a table nearby. One of the pieces of advice Mrs. Hernandez gave us was how to start a conversation with Tina after so many years apart. Again, we took her advice and I believe it made a big difference. Tina didn't seem intimidated by our presence, but my heart broke when my little girl tearfully asked, Daddy, why didn't you ever call me or write me? Why didn't I get cards for my birthdays? Thankfully, I was ready for it. I pulled a large stuffed manila envelope out of mom's purse. Tina, I thought of you every day we were apart. Here are all the letters I sent, all the postcards I sent. All the cards and letters were returned to me. Your mother sent them back. She didn't want me and your grandparents in your life. Twice I hired lawyers to get her to let me talk to you. I showed Tina the envelopes on each of which Haley had handwritten. Return to sender. But why did she do that, Daddy? I wanted to reply, Because your mother is a bitch. But I didn't. I took her hand and said, Someday you're going to have to ask your mom about this, but not today. Today let's just talk together. You, me, and your grandparents. We all love you and want to know how you're doing in school. What are your friends' names? Do you play sports? Three hours flew by. The five of us got into Dad's Lincoln and drove to Haley's house, meeting the allotted time. Haley was standing on the porch smoking a cigarette, looking pissed off. I parked the car at the curb when Tina asked from the back seat, I want to show you my room. I looked at Haley standing on the porch and replied, I don't know if that's a good idea today, Tina. Your mom doesn't seem to want us in your house. But it's my house, and I should have the right to invite people into my room. Tina looked so offended that Mom said, Why don't you show me your room today, Tina? Next time we can all see it. Tina agreed to this. Mrs. Hernandez said she needed to be with them. Mom, Mrs. Hernandez, and Tina got out of the back seat and walked up to the porch. Dad and I couldn't hear the words clearly, but the exchange was heated. As intimidating as Haley looked, Mrs. Hernandez was even scarier. A few minutes later, Mom, Mrs. Hernandez, and Tina entered the house. Haley stayed on the porch and shot daggers of eyes at Dad and me. She even tripped us up. To this day, I don't understand why Haley hates me so much. We stood there for about ten minutes when two patrol cars pulled up, one in front of our car and one behind. I'll admit that for a moment I panicked. Had my hit and run with Ronald Young gotten out? Had someone figured out that I was behind the fake internet scam? I was this close to being back together with my little girl, and here it was? As four police officers spilled out of two patrol cars, Barry Stewart pulled up in the driveway and ran to the porch. Mrs. Hernandez met them at the front door. Dad and I watched the police officers handcuff Haley and Barry. What the hell was going on? I wanted to jump out of the car, but Dad held me back. I'm going to go take a look, Charlie. You stay here. It wasn't a request, it was an order. Before Dad could get out of the car, Mom came out of the house, quickly walked over to the car and got in the back seat. Barry and Haley were being ushered into one of the patrol cars by two policemen. One cop from the second car stayed on the porch. The other went into the house with Mrs. Hernandez. They came back with Tina. Mom, what the hell is going on? I don't know. Mrs. Hernandez was looking around Tina's room when she noticed a toy on her shelf. She picked it up and then asked Tina some questions that I didn't quite hear. After Tina answered the questions, Mrs. Hernandez pulled out her phone and called the police. She told them to come with two patrol cars and to be quick. That's all I know. At that moment, Mrs. Hernandez approached our car. I'm sorry, but Tina is coming with me to the station. We need to ask her some questions. Call Miss Harper and have her meet us there. 
Tina will probably stay with the social services family until everything is sorted out. I had to ask, what exactly will be sorted out? What's going on? We don't know yet. I don't think Tina has been molested, but some suspicious things were found in her room and the police have to investigate. In the meantime, Tina will be safe with me. Please be patient. Please trust me. I only care about Tina's welfare. Call Mrs. Harper. It took three weeks, but eventually we got the whole story. And thanks to Gladys Harper's skill, everything turned out in our favor. When Mrs. Hernandez found the stuffed animal on Tina's shelf, she immediately recognized it as a remote camera. Mrs. Hernandez called the police. The camera was enough to get a search warrant. Barry's computer was found with all the information on it. It turned out that Haley didn't know about Barry or his spying. It didn't help that Mrs. Hernandez echoed Haley's words at school, calling Mrs. Hernandez a fat, ugly, leering mochi who belongs in Mexico. Judge Torres did her best to look nonchalant, but it couldn't help Haley. Miss Harper stacked the deck so high that Haley wasn't even given visitation rights. Two months after arriving in Texas, we were leaving in Daddy's car with Tina strapped into the seat next to Mommy. Tina and I moved into my in-law's house. For almost the entire first year, we had to treat Tina. On the advice of the therapist, we even allowed Trent to attend Tina's 11th birthday party. Forgiveness was part of the therapist's recommendations, which meant allowing Haley's mother limited access to Tina. Those two things kept me on my toes, but after a half-hour conversation with Tina's therapist, I agreed that it was for Tina's sake, and I just had to accept it. The hardest part was when Haley moved back to the city. We let Tina visit her mom at her grandmother's house a few times, until her mom got a call from Margaret Turner. I hate to do this, but I have to tell you. Haley says horrible things about you, Charlie and Hank. I just can't believe I raised such a horrible person. It breaks my heart but I don't want you to alienate me from my granddaughter. I don't think Haley should be with Tina anymore. That was all I needed to hear. Haley was cut off from Tina, and by going to court, she lost all rights to Tina. It was disgusting to say the least. Haley was swearing and threatening all of us, including Tina and Margaret, before she was escorted out of the courtroom by her embarrassed attorney. Our family life was becoming like a bad episode of The Jerry Springer Show. Haley refused to obey the judge's order and made a big deal out of it, showing up at our door at odd hours, ignoring the restraining order we eventually served her, banging on our door whenever we didn't answer. Even after she spent a weekend in jail, nothing changed. When the police proved to be a weak deterrent, I decided to resort to another tactic. Once again, I sat across from Juwan Price at a downtown diner. Leaning on her is a grand. Two grand is physical impact. Ten is permanent. I don't want her to get hurt, just walk away. Okay, we'll politely ask her to leave town. Juwan accepted the envelope and left. I wasn't surprised to learn that two weeks later, Haley was back in Texas. A year later, I was surprised to learn that she had moved back in with Barry Stewart when he was paroled. The last I heard from Margaret was that she and Barry were living in Nicaragua after he skipped out on his parole. I ended up talking to Tina's therapist about Haley. She said it's impossible to make a third-person diagnosis, but given some of Haley's behaviors, it's likely she suffers from one or more psychoses. I was glad to see this woman go for the foreseeable future. During all of this drama, it turned out that I had actually acquired a marketable skill during my time in prison. My father provided me with capital, and I was able to open a small store in a shopping center where I did website design and personal computer repair. No ordinary firm would hire a criminal, trusting him or her with so much information, but having my own business worked. Very few, if any, of my clients did background checks on me. And I played fair, no joke. I made fifty to 60000 a year, enough to pay the rent on our apartment and provide for Tina and my needs. It had been four years. For the last three years, Tina has been jogging and bicycling with me. She is going to be an excellent middle-distance runner. The high school track coach has his eye on Tina. Next year, Tina will probably compete in high school as a sophomore. Saturday morning, Tina and I spent the morning bicycling and running a fun run in Crystal Lake. A 25-mile bike course followed by a 10-kilometer run. Throughout the bike course, we stayed together. The last two miles, we rode behind a woman who pedaled fast, even with one prosthetic leg. Tina remarked how courageous it was to compete against such an obstacle. Of course, this woman reminded me of Candy, but she had short brown hair and her prosthetic leg was very different from Candy's. 
I never once looked at her face as we passed her, but the memory of that night with Candy almost embarrassed me. After all, I was with my daughter, not the best time to be sprouting wood. We switched from bike to run, and 42 minutes later, as Tina and I approached the finish line, a woman passed and finished in front of us. Tina walked up to her while we were catching our breath and introduced herself. The woman stood with her back to me and graciously accepted Tina's outstretched hand. That was amazing. Thank you. Tina kept walking and talking and I held back, not wanting to interrupt her. It's like Tina to make new friends wherever she goes. Lately, she's been trying to ask me out more often and strike up conversations with women she doesn't know. After a few minutes, they stopped and turned to me. It was a face I could never forget. This is my dad, Charlie Klein. Dad, this is Casey Sweeney. Candy, now Casey, looked at me, not recognizing me at first, but something flashed in her eyes. Nice to meet you, Casey. I shook her hand. Dad, I told Casey we'd stop at that place on the river where you like to eat. Casey agreed to join us. I laughed. That would be great. We're heading to the Broken Paddle, do you know it? Now Casey had time, and she remembered when and why we first met. Maybe I should let you two have some father-daughter time. Let me take a reprieve. Casey, that's very nice of you, but we've been spending time together all week. I think Tina would enjoy the company of another person of her sex for a change. Please don't disappoint Tina or me. Join us. Are you sure? I replied, do I need to beg? If Daddy won't, I will. Please come with us. Casey smiled. Okay, I'll meet you there. As Tina and I stowed our bikes in the car, I said a little prayer that Casey wouldn't screw with us and meet us at the broken paddle. She did show up, and for the next half hour, while I sat at a table eating a burger and drinking a beer, they talked between appetizers like old friends. Tina was very excited to learn that Casey graduated from the Art Institute with a degree in photography. The Art Institute is Tina's favorite museum in Chicago, and art is her favorite school subject. I spent some time eavesdropping and learned that Casey works for a marketing company as a product photographer for online catalogs. Most small retail stores that don't have their own staff use an agency like the one Casey works for to create their store websites. Their conversation was interrupted by a young man asking Tina if she wanted to join him and his friends in a game of beanbag toss. Tina asked Casey and I if that was okay to do. Sure, it would give me a chance to talk to your dad. I agreed and Tina left with the young man. I followed her departure with my eyes, glad I could keep her in sight. You'll have a lot of work to do. She's already a beautiful young woman. Yes, but she has a good head on her shoulders. I trust her. Thank you for letting me join you too. I didn't know what to expect when you recognized me. I'm glad you recognized. I don't remember Tina getting attached to anyone as quickly as she did to you. I want you to know something. When I was in the business, I didn't react to men the way you did. The way you acted with that man at the bar, and the way you treated me respectfully that night. Why didn't you ever call me again? I was hoping you would call. I decided to tell her the truth. I needed to deal with my reunion with Tina first. And when that turned into me becoming a full-fledged single parent, I focused on our relationship and Tina's mental health. Second, I had just gotten out of prison, and it would have been easy to fall in love with you especially with how beautiful you were. And you didn't want to fall in love with a whore. I didn't say that. Please don't put words in my mouth and don't think that way. I'm sorry. Are you still working as an escort? I decided to use a nicer expression to describe Casey's profession. No, not since I graduated and got this job. I have a good income and health insurance. I quit the day I was hired. My medical bills are paid and I got a new leg. And how are your parents? I seem to remember you and them being estranged. You have a good memory. Mom talks to me now. Dad still has a hard time accepting that I spent 18 months selling myself. He says he'd rather mortgage their house and empty his 401k, but I could never do that to them. It's been three years since my last date. And even though it's been a while, Dad seems to want to forget that horrible time in our lives. Casey and I spent the rest of the hour talking about Tina and our work. When Tina returned to our table, it was time to leave. Can Casey come over for dinner next weekend? 
All I could think about at that moment was how happy I was to have such a smart daughter. Dinner next weekend started a string of dinners, then dates, then romances. Casey and I have been dating for a little over a year now. I've been thinking about proposing to her and Tina is all for it. She loves Casey and they've become best friends. Before I ask Casey, I'm going to ask for her father's hand in marriage. Hopefully this will help in some small way to spur their too slow reconciliation. Her father, like many men, wonders why the fact that Casey was a prostitute doesn't bother me. Perhaps it would, but Casey and I have talked it out. We both agree that fidelity in marriage is non-negotiable. Some might say I'm a complete idiot for marrying a woman who was once a prostitute and allowing her into my daughter's life. But let me tell you a little story. Two years before that race day in Crystal Lake, I was dating a very nice woman and we were getting serious. One day she asked me how I lost my two front teeth. I decided to tell her the whole truth, including my relationship with Ron Young, but not about the subsequent attempt on his life. Shortly thereafter, she became unavailable for dates and any meetings. The message was clear. She could not tolerate a man around her who had done what I had done to survive a prison sentence. After a few months of getting to know Casey, when things got serious and we became exclusive, I decided that Casey needed to know the truth and let the cookie crumble now, not later. Casey looked up at me when I finished the story and her blue eyes sparkled. Sometimes, in order to survive, we do things that are contrary to who we think we are. The most important thing to remember is that you can't let it change you from the inside out. You have to forgive yourself and vow to remain who you used to be. You are back to being Charlie Klein, a loving father and just a good guy. If you need to forgive yourself for what happened in prison, start forgiving yourself today. I love you, Charlie Klein, and don't think you have anything to be ashamed of. Of course, Casey didn't say that when she hugged me, but she didn't need to say it. Sometimes forgiveness, if you love the right person, is all you need to live a good life. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.